everyone. I'd like to welcome Melanie Franklin. She's our famous speaker, and we, we are glad to have her uh, here in our uh, hosting our event and speaker for our event. Uh, she's going to talk to us about introduction to Agile and how to apply it to project management and so on. And uh, uh, Melanie, will, uh, we are looking forward to your talk. Please, Great. Uh, let's go for it then. Okay. Um, just to put this in context, um, the first book I wrote on this subject was published in 2014. Um, and this approach to, to managing change um, starts with an assumption that a change initiative is both a mixture of um, projects which deliver the tangible change. So we know that we're creating something of value, but we have to partner it with the behavioral change piece, which means people use what we've created. Um, so that first book in 2014 has become a, a global um, qualification now um, from APMG called The Agile Change Agent. And during lockdown, I had to write the second edition of the book. Um, and there is now a second course called The Agile Change Coach, um, which is all about the persuasive activities that we do to get people um, taking notice of the initiative we're running, um, to feel positive about um, adopting the new ways of working. Um, and getting involved, the collaboration piece, actually wanting to get involved, finding the time to get involved. So um, what I'm talking about right now are two um, uh, very well respected qualifications. Um, it's exciting stuff. I'm excited because um, when you think that over sort of 600,000 people now have the sort of um, qualifications from the certified um, or from the Scrum Alliance, um, we also then have, um, I think it's 150,000 uh, have taken qualifications from the Agile Business Consortium. So I think we know that we're in a we're in a good place in terms of people understanding more about Agile but it's agile from our world. When I say our world, I, I am referring to um, my world of project program, portfolio management, change management. And I know that we, we are a tribe. We do have our ways of doing things. My job really is to actually build um, this kind of interest and willingness to participate um, in uh, team leaders, supervisors, line managers from the business um, who are actually experiencing change and who we need desperately um, to come on board and provide us with that practical sort of um, uh, emphasis. So that's the, my take on the world and that's what I do for a living. Um, so let's have a quick look. Right, there are, when I wrote the Agile Change Approach, I cut across all of the Agile qualifications that are out there and all of the methodologies. Um, and I, I do um, sometimes get very um, uh, rude emails from people saying, how dare I, that's not how we do it in SAFE, or that's not what, what a certified Scrum Master would do, or that's not what a certified product owner would do. And I think, oh heavens, no, this is not about particular methodologies. This is more about um, a way of thinking, um, uh, how we prioritize our work, how we do our work. So the concepts really, um, if, if we can apply these five concepts um, at every level within the organization from every perspective, we'll pretty much be on course with being agile. The first and number of you referred to it in the chat was that it is all about delivering business value um, and effectively understanding the business need, what value the business wants really is the purpose of any initiative and it's delivering it what they want when they when they need it. And therefore, um, this should drive the prioritization of our work. Uh, it's very difficult, I think, to flip um, on its head how we sort of get information from our, our users sometimes who will come at us with a sort of giant shopping list of all their wants and needs all a bit muddled up because they are wants and they are needs and they are at either end of the spectrum in terms of importance um, and in order to sort of shuffle through that and get some kind of prioritization we've really got to keep pushing back and going yes but what will make the greatest difference you know, what will actually help you either achieve more revenue, um, reduce your costs, or perhaps do something that totally aligns with the purpose and value of your organisations. I mean, we can drop down to another level of benefits, which is 
you know, does it increase your staff engagement, your customer satisfaction, uh, your regulatory compliance? And then we can drop down even further and say, does this actually make somebody's job easier, more intuitive, faster to complete? Does it get rid of rework and mistakes? But I think we have to have that conversation about, hang on, hang on, what are, what are we trying to achieve here? What, what is the benefit that we're going for? Um, and I'm, in my experience, that's not always an easy conversation. As human beings, we are very good at identifying, um, maybe not expressing sometimes, but identifying features and functions. We are naturally good at writing a shopping list, but stepping back and saying, but what of those items are the most important and why is not something we're quite as good at. So actually being able to achieve that business need, it's easy to say, but it is so much harder to do. We have to keep that foot on the pedal though, because that business need should also lead us to a timetable, absolutely. Um, and that we need using our prioritization to sort of really stick to that. So let's not overcommit and say, we're gonna do everything. Let's work through starting with the most valuable and working our way down and jettisoning things that are less important if the time is being taken up by more complex issues than we'd first anticipated. Let's get rid of this. I was going to deliver on the 15th of December. Now that's being pushed back to the end of January, simply because the cost to the business is huge. In a world where there are so many changes taking place, if I've managed to get a particular department or team geared up to start working in a new way. If we've notified their customers and it's all on track, and then we pull back and go, oh, there's a six week delay. The actual cost of trying to mobilize that effort again, six weeks later is huge. And we become a distraction to business as usual. So staying on time is not just because it's, honest and true and it builds trust uh, in terms of we've said we're, we're, we're doing what we said we'd do but it's that cost that hidden cost to the business of sort of almost taking them up the hill letting them roll back down it again before we ask them to climb it all over again so on-time delivery absolutely is connected to our ability to deliver benefits and I think for me, the concept of this iterative approach, um, incremental, iterative, whatever you want to do, you can call it chunks, you can call it waves of change. Uh, but I think for me, it's a safety net, actually. Um, it enables me to deliver on time in a very practical sense, in that I, I heard myself saying it only this morning, I'm running two multi-million pound programs at the moment. Um, and I have to keep saying, and I heard myself saying, you know, out loud, just do the minimum, get it out there. Let's find out how it's going to work in practice. And, it, and for me, that that ability to be able to say, you can come back with version two, Mel, you can come back with version three, you can keep adding, but get something out there on time, get it up and running. Let's see what the feedback's like is so important to me knowing that I, I don't have to perfect things. And I think, to be honest, um, a lot of the conversations I have now are about in a VUCA world, where we talk about volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. Perfectionism is a very, it comes at a very high cost because it comes at the cost of procrastination, delays, while people wait for a sort of a, this perfect world where all the answers that they're looking for are available. The iterative approach saves me every time because it says, you can always come back, Mel. You can come back for a second pass, but just get something up and running. And you know what? I'm, I'm keeping a running total, by the way. And it's about 50-50 at the moment where I'm thinking, oh, there's so much more I could do to this. I can make it look so much better. I can streamline this. But just get out your initial version, Mel. It's only about one in two times that we actually do come back at a second pass because things are moving so fast that getting something up and running, um, actually, it's the next thing that people want rather than a more refined version of, of something I've already delivered to them. So at the moment, the running total is about 50-50. 
And then, of course, it's about the evolving solution. Um, and that's what we're talking about, isn't it? It's I am delivering something that is um, emergent or evolving. Those seem to be the, the two words of choice, to be honest. Um, it's all about not waiting for that perfection. And there's something else, which is the earlier I deliver the start of that evolving solution, the earlier it can start to evolve, which means that I'm staying relevant because you see a little bit of what I've got for you. You start to use it. You come back to me within the moment commentary about what's working, what's not, what's really helpful, what surprised you that is now so much better, what's disappointed you because actually that's not working as you'd hoped. But these are all in the moment, very relevant pieces of feedback, which can then shape that next delivery. So that evolving solution, I think, just keeps me up to date. And then sitting behind all of this, which again is something that you all raised in the chat, was that collaboration piece. The one thing I'm gonna say though, is that um, the definition of collaboration is it's organized sharing. We know it's sharing, we know it's bringing people together, but it's organized sharing of information and activities. And when you start to scratch the surface of that, it just makes us realize, you know what? We do actually have to organize this. We have to work out how we can best work together. And I'm not going to lie to you, in a, in a hybrid world, I was on a call earlier today um, talking about the difficulties of having some people in an office working together and some people dialing in from wherever in the world they are and actually just how difficult that is um, and how there is a disparity now between those who perhaps might be physically together and those who are dialing in. Um, it is definitely that the big group I run, which is the continuous change community, we have been talking for a while about our concerns about them and us. Um, and therefore, it just makes me work even harder at my collaborative approaches, thinking not just platforms, but makes me think, yeah, but practically, how are we doing this? How are we making sure everybody has um, a, a really um, easy way of doing things um, and, and actually um, collaborating? OK, so if we agree with the uh, the concepts, I'm going to take us into the agile planning technique around the uh, um, uh, the roadmap. Has anybody got anything that they're putting in? Um, uh, yeah, hybrid collaboration is hard work and the tools are key. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. Um, I don't think, certainly all the soundings I'm taking at the moment, I don't think anybody's got a silver bullet. There's no magic out there. I think that we are natural um, social animals. So if I'm in the office with people and I, I was in, I went back into the office in April and I, I go in two or three days a week. Um, now, most of my clients are all over the world, so I don't get to see them. And it's really noticeable what I'm missing is the little bits of glue that hang our relationships together. That when I'm in the office, um, I, I'm, I'm always making sure that I'm having little coffees and things and catching up with people much harder to do on Zoom. So collaboration requires us to think through all of this. OK, um, it's not as easy as it looks. Um, for those of you asking about the slides, um, the slides aren't be, be available. What I've done is I've written you a 10 page document where I slip the slides in with the script um, so that you can have an actual document and read through what I've actually said. Um, so you can follow along um, and um, there is uh, and, and the recording of all of this will hopefully if I'm making sense will be available to you as well. Right. So how do I apply these concepts? This is what the roadmap's all about. So at the end of every iteration, you can call it an increment, you can call it a wave, uh, you can call it a stage, you can call it a tranche. Um, or a chunk. I mean, it depends where you're working in the world, what we want to call it. Um, but at the end of it, um, there's an outcome. And I think this is the thing that makes sure that we are delivering business value. Because I am not just delivering something that didn't exist before. I'm not just delivering outputs from a project. I am delivering a capability. And that means that I've got to bring together not only the creation of something, but also how it is used. So all of the pieces around business readiness, 
have to be partnered with whatever it is we're creating in the project world. And that means that we have to find those people who are really going to lead the implementation of what we're doing. Um, whether or not we put that into um, a change management role or whether it's genuinely people in the business who are sort of, they have a foot in both camps, they're doing their day job, but at the same time, they're also supporting the project. I've got somebody at the moment who um, returns to her day job um, where she is a supervisor of a very large team uh, at about 11, 11.30 in the morning. Um, she comes online around 8.30 and um, she is absolutely key to the team in that um, she gives them the up-to-date business perspective um, that uh, really brings alive the capability that we're delivering. Um, and she also spends some of that time um, working on her own, uh, creating new process flows. Uh, she drafts templates. She holds little workshops with people from the business um, to get their buy-in, get their approval of what she's creating. So she's delivering the ways of working. And in the project team, we're delivering the more tangible pieces of change. And that's how we get to a capability. Um, and I've kept uh, a very simple life cycle model here, which says in every iteration, I think we should be doing some getting started, which is the brainstorming of all the things we need for this iteration to create this capability, not the end to end planning, because we're agile. The making progress is that hard graft of doing the technical work on the project side, doing the business readiness piece from the business side. And then the realizing benefits is genuinely putting it into operational use, um, training people up in how they're going to be working from now on. Um, if they weren't involved in making progress, we, we need to really show them what's now expected of them. Um, now, the long tail for each of, of those realizing benefits pieces, it obviously goes on. Um, we start using something, but we obviously go through that learning dip. And that may take weeks or months afterwards. And I think that also brings us into um, one of our challenges, which is that whilst we're getting used to, to something out of one iteration, uh, another iteration is already underway. And I think that pace of change, um, that high volume of change certainly keeps us on our toes. What we've got with these agile concepts is that, of course, these iterations, they are the evolving solution. They end in an outcome each time. Um, and of course, they are an iterative approach because we've delivered one capability. We can add and tweak that capability or we can add something else that enables us to do more and go further than we went before. So the evolving solution and iterative approach work together. Um, and of course, <laughs> what capability an organization wants is driven by the business need. Um, I am, uh, I spent all of Friday trying to um, devise uh, a plan for next year. I'm launching an entire new product range for an organization. Um, talking to the board about what their business need is, which ultimately is sell more stuff. Um, we can refine that and say sell more stuff online um, and in fact we've refined it even further and said sell more new stuff online don't touch our bricks and mortar business we've still got footfall we've still got people coming in where we've got that business but we want to now make digital only products and we want to be targeting a whole, whole new customer range that business need conversation has been bouncing back and forth, frankly, for about four months. Um, but my job on Friday was really trying to hone in on this is what we're going to be delivering in the end of the first quarter. And this is what we will have that doesn't it already exist. This is the customer base that will actually be targeted. This is the revenue that we're expecting to be delivering from quarter two, the start of quarter two onwards. So very much. Um, the decisions about what capability is delivered in which iteration is, is driven by business need. And whilst I have an idea of what I think we will deliver before the summer in iteration two, what I think we'll deliver over the summer in a somewhat lighter iteration, and then probably two more iterations before the end of next year, 
I've got an idea what those outcomes are, but I'm not going to hold myself to them because actually the, the first iteration in which we deliver something useful it is going to be uh, the bellwether by which we make further decisions. I, I've laid out a, an indication of what it is I think we'll do and what the revenue model is off the back of that. But, you know, the proof is in the pudding. So let's get the pudding on the table very early. Um, and that also brings me to the fact that on time delivery, I'm gearing people up and that's a, I've got a sales team. I've got a marketing team. Um, they, uh, the marketing campaigns are being created almost alongside um, the product ranges being created. Um, so everybody's got to collaborate together um, and we need to hit our deadlines. Otherwise, anybody running late has a really big knock on effect for everybody else. I think that's something that we don't talk about enough in collaboration. If you if one part of the the uh, the network delivers late, then all the other dominoes fall over. So that's definitely a problem. And therefore, collaboration is the only way that this entire planning technique actually works. Uh, let me get a sense of um, whether or not I'm, I'm making sense so far. So if anybody wants to put their thumb in the air, if I'm making sense, uh, if I'm boring you, that's OK. We'll stop early. Um, <laughs> I'm sure we could all find things to do. All right. W one thumb up. Oh, oh, no, a few more. <laughs> OK, then that means we, we won't stop early. You want me to keep going? OK. All right. I'll give it a whirl. Um, and let's see how we, we get on. But um, put stuff in the chat if there's something that you um, want to say. Um, you think I'm being too generic, somebody says. Um, so uh, if you want to pose more of a question about something specific, do let me know what you want me to comment on. Um, this is uh, in terms of how we use all of this, then let's have a look at what's really going on. Um, and I'm going to go back to my launch of my product range um, for next next year, because um, the thing is. Um, what I'm thinking about is the end goal. This is the big conversation that we have to have, because. I think with Agile, you really do turn things on its head. Instead of me being able to work up from a whole list of requirements to a lovely Gantt chart that has a lovely flow to it, it's a logic to it. With Agile, it's completely the opposite way around. What I need to go to first is the end goal. What, what, is the, what are you trying to get me to create? What's the, the big idea here? What's the vision or the blueprint for your business or the target operating model, whatever you want to call it. But what is it that you want from this initiative? That's the first thing. Now, instead of telling people how long that will take based on all the requirements. No, 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 we don't do that. We stick with this end goal and we say, OK, now, how long have I got to do that? based on your understanding of your marketplace, your competitors, um, what you think your customers want, how long are you gonna give me? So let's say it's 12 months. I've got 12 months to play with. So whether it's an increment or iteration, the, 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 the words I use are interchangeable, a chunk. Um, I'm thinking, well, how long have I got? Um, it might, I, I want to have um, uh, an iteration that's maybe three months no longer. Um, because I find that people's patience is not that great anymore. We, we are in a world of short termism. Um, being able to deliver something within a quarter for a CEO is incredibly helpful. Um, it's very helpful for the CFO as well. Um, but also, I think that um, 10 to 12 weeks, I, I can use sprints or time boxes to chunk that up and keep people more focused. But personally, if you go over the three month mark, yeah. It's, it's beginning, it, it's getting a little tired. Um, equally though, um, an, an increment or an iteration um, of about eight weeks um, is probably in, in the work that I do, which is delivering new digital products, getting customers up and running, is probably about the shortest we can do because you've got to have an iteration or increment that's long enough to get something valuable done. Um, so it can't be so short that you can't actually get an, an outcome that's useful, a real capability. Um, so we're talking about what that end goal is, you know, and, and to what, what is it you want? You want a new product range. You want it to be unique to your digital platform. You need to put that platform in place. Um, so getting all of these things sorted 
and having that conversation. How long have I got? And also, how long do you want me to, um, how much money do you want me to spend on it? What is my budget? And those answers are based on the value of the end goal. Um, and therefore I'm looking to senior leaders, and this is when the wheels really fall off. I'm looking to senior leaders to provide that structure, um, that boundary. And I find that I have to go back and forth quite a lot and keeping them focused on what is it that you're really looking for? And those conversations definitely strategic and they definitely evolve. But once I've got a good understanding of that, then that becomes the, that end goal becomes the, the, the fulcrum around which I can operate because I can then divvy that up into increments or iterations. Um, so I, I can work out what the outcomes are gonna be. I decompose the end goal into um, three, four, five, six outcomes. That's what I've done for the whole of next year. The program starts on the, uh, um, at the very beginning of January and it runs through to the end of, of next year. Um, and I've already worked out, as I said, what I think the outcomes are likely to be. But again, this is the thing. The end goal is helps me with the uncertainty because I can't go too much further forward. There's no point me planning everything for next year. I'll just plan up January, February, March. I know what the outcome should be, what the capability is going to be. I know which products we're going to be developing and which part of our, our customer base we're going to target. Now. During that time, I will be talking to the board continually to try to get an understanding of perhaps what the, uh, their horizon scanning, you know, what they think is happening in the marketplace, because things move very quickly. And I do recognize that once I've sort of delivered um, that first capability, um, my next iteration, um, it might have to pivot in terms of what's expected, because in fact, the, the end goal has pivoted in some way. There's an amendment there. There's a greater understanding by senior leaders of exactly what they want. They've seen other things that uh, competitors are doing. They're listening more to their customers. They've sharpened their idea. And then again, with the next iteration, again, I might have to pivot to, to what is expected because that end goal has somewhat amended. And that's why, you know, when it comes to chunking things up into the desired outcomes, you then focus on the first outcome that you think will deliver the greatest value, knowing that you've got an open mind about what comes after that. You've got ideas, but you go into it with a very open mind. That, I think, is where the flexibility is. And this diagram is something that I have drawn, I don't know how many times around the world which is that the danger of talking in deliverables is that actually we don't want to talk about specifically what I'm going to deliver for you, because if I do that, I'm, I'm not being agile. Um, it's much more around, uh, I know what the deliverables are and what, because uh, they're part of that capability I'm trying to create. Um, but as far as later on, don't tie me down to that because um, you're tying me down there for to specific um, features and functionality and, and possibly to a specific technical solution. Surely it would be better if I did this, which is that what I'm talking about is outcomes, talking about business value, um, which has a longevity to it. So I've decomposed the end goal into these. Um, and therefore, I can give you a sense of, I know where I'm going with this. I'm open to suggestions of how we change it, but I know where I'm going with this. I mean, for example, I have to, it's quite a high value product that I'm working on next year. And I have to deliver 1,000 customers um, by year three um, who are each buying a product that's somewhere between um, uh, $900 and $1,500. Um, uh, it's they it's usually a one-off purchase so I've continually got to find those 1,000 customers um, so what am I looking at in terms of the first um, capability um, I'm looking for um, the customer base that's closest to what they've got at the moment the one that they know the most and that is actually clamoring already clamoring for certain digital products 
um, and therefore that's a bit of a shoe in that's a quick win um, what do I think is that's going to deliver I think that's going to deliver several hundred buys um, by Easter and it's going to certainly go some way to paying back some of the development fees that we're going to start incurring um, so already I'm getting an early payback as well Now, deliver on time, I think one of the greatest impediments to deliver on time is it's not usually the project team. Once I put my project team together, when it comes to the tangible change, I'm OK. My problem is that there are just not enough people in the business um, with enough time available to really come and bring their perspective and really contribute their specialist knowledge. Um, so I'm using this agile approach to, to basically be more specific. This is the capability I've got on the table right now. OK, so these are the specialist resources I need to start working with. I need their brains to be contributing. And in fact, I can even be specific about when I will need their help to deliver something. And I think it's I am noticing particularly that. This is very important when there are multiple changes happening within the same business area. I've got a help desk function that is um, or a customer uh, customer services function um, that's got uh, 185 staff members there. Um, there are several supervisors within that on different shift patterns who have a really good understanding um, of their business lines. And those are the ones I need to focus on, but I'm I'm not the only change that's happening for them. Um, so being able to say, I really need you in, um, I've been working with them in November, I really need you in November. And actually using my um, portfolio management skills to work out every other change that's affecting them uh, and talking to those um, managers and, and getting them to think about this has enabled us to load balance effectively um, the impact that we're putting on the business um, and, and has made us look very human. It's made us look really well organized um, and respectful, empathetic, um, which has definitely um, in, you know, it's that recognition. We know you're busy. We know you have a day job. And we know that you are performance managed on that day job and that actually the contribution that you make to us, which is seismic, isn't recognised in your performance management. So in a way, we're asking for something that's incredibly business valuable, which is their subject matter expertise. At the same time, we know that actually they might occasionally get thanked by their manager or director. But they're doing it out of the kindness of their hearts because their business metrics that they are evaluated on are taking a hit because they're spending time with us. So being respectful of um, and, and that um, that pressure on them is, I think, part of, of the emphasis around collaboration is that we will organise your involvement. We won't just surprise you with. Um, please read this and give us your comments by the end of tomorrow, um, because that's the, the sharpest way, I think, to, uh, to, to ruin any kind of idea of collaboration. Yeah. Something else I wanted to uh, bring up was that certainly I work with a lot of teams, um, whether they like it or not, they are still working in a waterfall way. I have an example, um, obviously can't quote the companies, but I have an example of, um, I've got a new HR platform going live for one of my clients in June of next year. It's due to, to land on the 30th of June. Um, they are running it as a waterfall project. It was how they were procured. Um, they were given all of the um, requirements up front um, by uh, senior leaders in the HR function, um, a couple of whom have inevitably left already. But anyway, the procurement department set them up on a, a sort of uh, very traditional uh, purchase um, uh, project and they will deliver at the end of next year we don't get any interim deliverables there's no sort of agility to that so I know technically what I'm getting um, but of course the rest of the the unit are working in a more agile way and I think the the importance is to recognize that 
that's fine. We can still work together. Um, the first thing is that the various situations that are taking place, I've got a restructure of HR to, to manage because this platform will help them get rid of an awful lot of their day-to-day -day administrative tasks in two ways. It's going to automate and streamline a lot of paperwork, but it also comes with an app for staff and managers to do a lot more of um, their own administration. I, I don't just mean um, booking um, their own holiday and things like that. I mean that uh, this is a very large uh, food restaurant chain, can't say anymore. Um, and what it enables the staff to do um, is it enables them to swap shifts amongst each other. Um, and that's all then recorded. Um, so uh, if they have a childcare issue, for example, um, or a burst pipe at home, um, the restaurant still has somebody on shift uh, because they've called a mate and they've swapped shifts um, and they can do all of that on the app. Um, so I've got obviously quite a lot of, of changes of expectation to manage um, with um, restaurant managers, um, with their, their team leaders and with the staff as well. Um, so I can get on with all of that um, because frankly, what we're talking about is the app will enable you to um, to manage that sort of changing of shifts. But there's a whole load of accepting of that kind of behavior by the team leaders and the, the, the restaurant managers um, and just getting staff used to that idea of, of real life collaboration. Um, and also the restaurant managers taking on a lot more of the talent acquisition that HR were doing. So each of my waves of change is taking a chunk of that behavioral change and sort of trying to get it up and running. I don't need um, the, the platform or the app to be able to do a, a lot of that changing of behavior. Um, I can do it in a more manual way right now um, and get people used to things. So that's what I'm doing. But it does help me to have regular updates from the project team um, who can explain um, their design, they can explain the features and functionality they're putting in place. But I was global head of project and program management, so I really do appreciate them as much. It's empathy for, for them as well. Um, and that empathy is to understand that the last thing they need based on the contract they've got, which is a waterfall drop dead, it goes live on this day kind of contract, what they're fearful of the, and what will stop them um, collaborating with me and all, therefore I am representing, if you like, the voice of the business. And I've got a lot of those subject matter experts from the restaurants with me. Um, what will stop them collaborating with us is the fear that actually what's gonna come up the pipe from us is, oh, could you make it do this? And oh, we need it to do that. I mean, because all of that, as they know, it, if it hasn't already been asked for, you're going to get what you're going to get because that's how the contract was created. And therefore, there has to be that empathy back to them and, and saying, hey, give me early insight. Please, please demonstrate stuff as you're doing it. Um, we'll keep our mouth shut. You know, we'll work around it. If this is what we're getting. We'll honour that. But in exchange, I can promise you that what you'll have as you come towards the end of your project life cycle, which as we know is where all the testing is gonna sit for them. I promise you that I'm gonna have a motivated and engaged group of people willing to take part in the user acceptance testing. It's not something that you're gonna have to battle for. So I've got something of value for you. You've got something of value for me. Hey, let's collaborate. So I think those things need sort of working out basically. Oops, I'm trying to get the slides to move. And then finally, I think one of the things that we probably have to deal with um, is that business as usual, there are far too many changes happening at once. This is how it feels, I think, um, for, the, uh, for people in the organization, including my restaurant managers, because this is a, an HR system that's changing. Well, we've got a whole packaging change coming up um, in relation to um, uh, how we package the food, for example. Uh, we've got supply chain issues. Um, they've had all of the changes and still have all of the changes related to COVID. Um, now, 
any agile initiative. I think it's fair to say um, that as I moved towards Agile, I did recognize that the changes, the, the, the business process changes that I'm putting in place, um, I've quadrupled, quintupleted the change that I'm putting in, haven't I? Because I used to work in a more waterfall or, or traditional approach where I would have um, a sort of big bang, everything was ready, the, the complete solution, if you like, and there would be one set of sort of behavioral changes that isn't the case anymore um i need to get my restaurant managers changing how they do certain things at, at the end of every iteration every outcome comes with business changes so what's happening to their world of business as usual from one project has tripled quadrupled quintupleted the amount of change and then of course i'm not the only change in town so that's also happening so this is how it feels you know the business as usual has changed shape it's changed shape it's changed shape changed shape changed shape and changed shape so i think that in this world of uh, more flexibility more agility we need to recognize that what we've done is ramp up the the pace of change neuroscientifically we're still trying to catch up with the last change that happened before the next change comes along um, we are not as quick to adopt new behaviors as we are as quick to produce tangible changes through our project management um, so everybody's in a sort of game of catch up and i think what we need to do is basically pull together that if this is the sort of the transition that people go through when they're asked to work differently like you should see the um uh i was thinking of a, i'm trying to think of a polite word um let's say the chaos of um trying to get people to think about this idea of switching shift patterns if they have a problem who is their buddy how might that work are they in a small bubble with other people um who they can turn to if they can't turn up for their shift um all of these things happening there's obviously a sort of chaotic period before actually they start to master it and come out the other side um, so I think, first of all, when it comes to uh, how we're doing this, um, making sure that when we're in an agile way, if you are going to deliver value iteration after iteration, you've got to partner tangible change with behavioral change. And that means you need to set out what are all those, if you like, business readiness activities that we need to go through. Um, understand that that needs to be shared with everybody. Um, so because it is it's a shared responsibility um the project teams that i work with we talk about all of the things that the business needs to do to get ready um and the business hear from the project teams what they are going through in terms of trying to make the requirements work um and it's that shared understanding um it makes it easier to appreciate if you understand what the other person is trying to do um that's where empathy comes from walking in the shoes of others um creating a, an environment where people feel safe to speak up when they think that's not going to work or they feel safe enough to have a go at something and practice the new skills and you know providing i think one of the bigger picture items is um, how we have to provide resilience training now coping mechanisms if you like um, for this almost permanent state of flux that these more agile methods are creating within the business um, because otherwise we on the, the, if you like, the creators or the triggers of change in our project world, we suffer, speaking very selfishly, because if the business is so um, overwhelmed by the volume of change, how on earth am I going to get people to work with me to help me scope my particular initiative? So I think there's a there's a bigger picture at work here. So that was me, basically. Um, I'm now going to, I don't know how your chat function is going to work if you're all on mute and things, but um, so here, do you want to read some questions out to me or how do you want to do this? Uh, Steve and I will do that. Yeah, okay, then to start with, there was a question, there was some, uh, one of the uh, participants asked about the headings of the minimum viable product and the minimum marketable product and how that fits in with the idea of an iteration. 
Yeah, well, that's I think that is exactly what we are doing. If we, we look at the outcome, we brainstorm all the work required to deliver that outcome, which is the tangible change and the behavioral change. Um, and we work out, we prioritize it. Uh, the minimum, the absolute minimum we can get away with um, is the minimum viable product, minimum shippable product, minimum usable subset. I mean, every methodology has got a version of it. And of course, what we hope is that we won't just deliver the minimum, that we'll deliver, hopefully, um, if, if I keep it really simple and keep it into Moscow for a moment, not just the must-haves, but we'll also deliver the should-haves. And if I've got a bit of a following wind behind me, I might even get some of the could-haves done. But the secret to it is that you have to genuinely, from a business perspective, say, look, these are, this is the top stuff. This is, we call it must-haves, but actually you get a lot more traction in the boardroom if you talk about these are the top priorities. These are important, but not quite as important. And then these are all the added extras. You call the could-haves the added extras, the added value. But we know that if we're running short of time, it's those added extras that we start to jettison so that we could try to preserve the, the absolute essentials and the, the really important features. We've, we've jettisoned the nice to have, the added extras. So just, I'm always careful of language. And frankly, in the boardroom, the word minimum is not a sellable word. It does not inspire confidence. It's the same, frankly, as the words product backlog. I'm afraid the idea of a backlog does not win any friends. If you call it what the Agile Business Consortium calls it, actually, which is the uh, prioritised requirements list, that gets a lot more traction because it sounds, actually, it is a description of what it is. It's it's a requirement and it's prioritised. Calling it a backlog. Oh, that's a bit of a shot, you know, shooting yourself in the foot there, I think. I think, that also, I think well, that, that, that explains it. That's fine for me. Um, Perhaps if, if if that's not if someone can comment in chat if that's doesn't if that's not the, the answer hoped for uh, I think there is a related question as to what happens during an iteration when you when or if you discover that something's not quite right as to whether your scope creeps and and how you handle that no 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 scope creep because we've got to deliver on time and what that means is that when I discover a whole pile of work that I didn't realize we'd have to do, but to make this thing work, we will have to do it. Then it's basically, I've got a whole load of new requirements have come in. The key thing guys to avoid scope creep is you reshuffle the deck of cards. You had a whole load of stuff you were expecting to do. Some of that stuff has now come in and gone right onto the top of the must have pile. You've got to reshuffle everything and pull stuff out and go, that's going into could have now. So it is that willingness to reprioritize on the hoof, if you like, based on the new things that you discover. So that it, it, it's not about scope creep, it's, it's always scope change. We are very flexible to scope, but what will not creep is the timeline. I've still got to go live on the 15th of December, but I've now got a whole load of extra must-haves because the thing that we thought we could do now needs a lot more work. So I'm afraid to say that other things that were in the should haves have gone into the could haves, and some of the could haves have gone into the God, we're not doing that on this iteration. So it's prioritization that saves the day and stops. It's not scope creep, it's time creep that I'd be worried about. Okay. Um, um, there is a comment from Tom. What are the improvements? Quantitative, quantitatively of uh, of your way of working, time, value. Uh, I'm I'm not sure I understood the question, but I'll I'll what have a go. I... Um, it's uh, I think the thing if you're doing a return on investment model. Um, for whatever it is you're creating, you can immediately see that um, if you're going like me, if you're going to go live um, sometime in late March, um, rather than waiting till the end of December next year, I shall go live with certain products or certain customers. And based on that revenue model, what we're charging, um, uh, what it's costing us, uh, you'll start to see where that payback sits. But the payback is definitely coming in earlier. 
So does it change your net present value calculation? Absolutely, it does. Um, it, it, does it change your internal rate of return? Yes, it does. Yeah, because you are bringing forward an earlier revenue stream. Of course, it's a smaller revenue stream, but it's coming in earlier. And then hot on its heels will be another revenue stream and another and another. If you're not doing a revenue driven project and you're instead uh, in place to cut costs, then you will see that they, the cost reductions are coming in earlier. It's the same thing. It's just looking at it from a different angle. How do you manage the change within your iteration? Please cover the difference between the inc an increment and an iteration. Well, that's what I kept saying all the way through the presentation was that mm -hmm. I use the word iteration. Some methodologies use the word increment. It's the same thing, which is this, that it is uh, a, a, a sizable chunk of time. Um, my, as I said, I'm somewhere between sort of eight and the absolute maximum of 14 weeks. Um, why is it such a sizable chunk of time? Probably because the outcome, we want a genuine new capability. The organization should be able to do something that it could not do before. Now, within that, there will be a number of sprints, each of which are creating something that didn't exist before. Um, and it, you will obviously pull all those together um, and actually have that thing that the business can now do. It might be servicing a new customer group. It might be launching a, a, a new product. It might be changing an internal process. It might be creating um, a new team structure. But it is a capability that did not exist before. The organization can now work in a different way or work with a different group or offer different products out. And it the way that you control that iteration or increment, um, uh, Scaled Agile Framework often use the term increment, that chunk of time, that quite considerable chunk of time is too big to really conceive of on a day-to-day -day basis about really hitting the timeline. So of course you can use sprints to do that. Sprints or sometimes called time boxes, um, uh, I use, I tend to stick to a two weekly sprint. And if I've got multiple teams working on one of my initiatives, um, then I've got all of those teams on exactly the same cadence. So I've got one which has got um, five um, sprints. Uh, we spent uh, a little bit of time up front in getting started doing the brainstorming as a group across all of the teams. Um, and we come together in realizing benefits to get that implementation of the, the totality of all our work at the end. But what we've got is we've got five sprints each of two weeks. And basically that cadence runs through every team. Okay, I have a question, uh, the actual wording of it is how do we determine a project end date in an, an agile project? I think on the basis that you were talking about having known capabilities delivered uh, rather yeah. than known deliverables. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's not a bottom up approach where I calculate how long is it going to take me to create this? and therefore go back to the executive board with that answer. Instead, we start, it's completely a different way of doing things, it turns it on its head, because you talk about what is it that you want your organization to be able to do that it can't do at the moment. And you ask that question, well, how long, have, how long are you prepared to wait for that? Because I'm gonna use prioritization to shoehorn a solution into the available time frame. If they give me a completely ridiculous time frame, then I'm going to say you won't get anything workable in that time frame. But if they give me something that I think, okay, well, I can tell you, you know, you have to go back and forth on this. You can sort of say, right, okay, I won't be able to give you a full product range, but I will be able to give you this. If you want something by next summer, this is this is really what I think you would reasonably get done in that available time frame. How do you feel about that? And it's sort of going back and forth in that way. Um, I think there is um, there's a pragmatism here that we're we're looking for. Um, I will also throw in um, that conversations I've had. Um, uh, it's happening this year again, which is that I'm starting with one, as you know, in January, this organization that I'm working for has a financial year end of the 31st of December. So it was never going to tip past 
the end of December, because as the CEO said, I, you know, this is, I, I don't want it in another financial year. Um, so that is another pragmatic piece. And I will also pass on the fact that um, the CEO that I'm working with, I, I know him well, and he has the attention span of a goldfish. That puts me under tremendous pressure to make sure that my first iteration is, um, is long enough to get something of value created, but not so long that he'll lose interest um, because we do need him to be committed. And he has a tendency to his interest wanders with the next big idea. So um, there is something in there uh, about the, the, the real pragmatism and relationship management that goes with, you know, dealing with your sponsor. Probably worked out why I'm not announcing the company names now. <laughs> Uh, Thomas saying, define value and give an example. I'm sorry, Sahir, your sound is really bad. What did uh, you just yeah, say? The computer, sorry. Define value and give an example. Okay. Um, uh, value. Um, it makes it basically it makes a difference. It makes a positive improvement. So value is in the, the eye of the beholder. Um, if you're in a commercial organization, value is going to be we are selling more of something. We are getting revenue in through the door that we weren't getting in before. But equally, if I'm working in one of my healthcare programs at the moment, I'm restructuring something around um, uh, operating theaters. The, the value there is there's no revenue. Um, what we are looking for, though, is we are looking for greater throughput. We are effectively looking to operate on more people every single day. We have the operating theatres. We have our teams of surgeons and all of our uh, clinical staff. Um, but we are looking at ways that we can actually increase the throughput. And that is the value um, that we are looking for. So it, it, it really does depend on the initiative that you're working, working in. Thank you. Stephen, you got any more for uh, just, come to the last two minutes? I'm just looking, I'm just looking through. I, th I think we have, I think we've either answered them as specific questions or you've, or you have covered them as some of the participants have noted, you've covered them. As, well, that's a good idea. As, that's, as, I mean, remember, go, I really. just, uh, well, I um, said deliver on time. So, you know, I did say that we would finish at half past. So I absolutely want to live on that one. <laughs> well, that's right. Otherwise, I mean, I'm that, not being authentic. <laughs> well, no, as, you, as you say, we've, we, 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 we come to we come to a hard, a hard, a hard finish. Uh, and then for us yeah. to assess whether we've obtained the value that we expected from it, which I, I think I think we have. Uh, I think we have. Um, well, the final question then, which I think is a, the, the standard killer question that often comes in projects. What if everything is a must in terms of the Moscow world? As certainly mm -hmm. business people will often not admit that something isn't absolutely Well, necessary. I think, um, so I think there are a few things to that. First of all, we all know that it's a failure of leadership. Um, if somebody says everything is a must, that they are showing that they are very limited in their abilities, uh, because what it's screaming is that they, I cannot be bothered or I am incapable of prioritising. So that's the first warning sign that you're dealing with somebody who really is quite stupid. Um, I think the second thing is that we can take an argument which says, OK, um, if that's the approach, then what we're going to be doing is we're going to be spreading ourselves incredibly thinly um, across all of these pieces. And you have increased the risk that, in fact, none of them will be delivered um, to an acceptable level of quality. Um, and thirdly, on a very practical basis, um, I think what has to happen is that we have to help people do that prioritisation. Um, paired comparisons, for example, um, rather than giving people a big list and saying, well, which of these are essentials and which of these are non-essentials, which can frighten the hell out of them. Um, you get into conversations with where effectively you're doing paired comparisons and you put something up against something else and saying, right, when, when push comes to shove with these two items, which one makes the greatest business value? But, and the underlying piece of this is that often we cannot do this on our own. What we need is we do need the voice of the business um, to help us work out genuinely what will create the greatest business need and what actually 
is not quite so essential to make a difference to customers or revenue or throughput or whatever value it is that we're looking for. So sometimes we have to do the prioritization uh, because we're working with um, senior execs who uh, just simply are not putting the effort in. I think it's part of the collaboration, isn't it? There's all one team together to yeah to 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 assist each other. If people are are not necessarily familiar with the idea of things being other than absolutely essential, is to show mm -hmm. them how, what the effect is of that on the way the process will will pan out. <laughs> Right. Well, um, thank you. Um, I'm just reading the comments and one person said, well, the master chef's not on until 7.35, um, but I'm still going to go and grab a bowl of soup before in the next four minutes. So thank you very much. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, uh, if you've got any questions and you want to follow up, I am on LinkedIn. You can find me there. And Sahar is going to um, share all the, um, I think I've sent you the, uh, the paper, but if I haven't, I will make okay. a note to send it to you tomorrow morning for you to dispatch to yeah. everybody. I mean, business change is uh, STG and agile method STG. Would like to thank you very, very, very much, and would like you to choose a book, a BCS book as a, as a talking book. Thank you. Oh, thank and, you. Uh, we, I really, myself, I really enjoyed it. I loved it. I know, it's fun. <laughs> as well. well, it's never boring, is it? Your questions no. were brilliant, guys, because they were very. Um, very demanding questions um, and so I did appreciate it because it, it keeps you on my toes but I am definitely going now after having done um, uh, yeah I've done 12 and a half hours now um, and I didn't get a lunch break today um, so on that basis I am going <laughs> but thank you very much have a thank good you, evening Melanie. thank you uh, thank you, very much. Thank you thank for you. everyone and please don't forget I mean to contact me if you'd like to join the committee <laughs>